All right, thank you. Thank you. Lots of masochists in the audience, I love it. So I'm, I'm here to insult you, uh, because that's what we all want. No, I'm, I'm here to respectfully but regretfully inform you that none of your coins are money and you all have brain damage. But I also have brain damage because I think I can do something about that. So we're, we're in the same boat. So I'm, I'm Ethan, co-founder of Cosmo, CEO of Informal and, and Cycles. And uh, let's, talk about, let's talk about this. So where did this all start? It started with a tweet recently by, by Chris Berniski, which seemed like a great opportunity for me. Soul is as much money as ETH is. None of the coins are money. You all have brain damage. Ah, but they're as much money as their peers are, sir. Yes, they're all equally not money, right? So th this prompted me to, to actually write a long thread about this and, um, and create, create this talk. So let's get into it. When people with, that don't have brain damage say money, they usually mean one of two things, or potentially both. They, they are referring to a general unit of account, like the USD, or, and or they're referring to a generally accepted medium of exchange, something you can pay people with, like, like a bank deposit. But it almost never means something that's just a strong store of value, right? Unless you're in crypto. And there are way more things that are a store of value than things that are just a unit of account or a medium of exchange, which, which makes the UOA and the MOE much more specific to money, right? So here's a few examples of things that are stores of value. Does this thing point? No. Um, so houses, this is Drake's house, for instance. Certain versions of Google Maps actually refer to this as Kendrick's house, but that's, a, that's another matter. This is a rug, a rug can also be a store of value. Of course, if you get rugged by the, the wrong people, then uh, your value will disappear. This is, this is soybean oil. Now, I'm not a fan of soybean oil. I'm a seed oil disrespecter. But I, I put it up here because in the 60s, there was a company that was using uh, large vats of soybean oil as collateral against which they were taking out millions, hundreds of millions of dollars worth of loans. And Amex was actually like certifying that these vats contained soybean oil so that, so that it's, they could use it as collateral. Nice store of value. And the company realized, hey, Amex isn't really doing their due diligence. I can just fill these vats with water. And so they kept doing that and they got exposed for fraud. And, uh, you know, so the... the <laughs> Amex's stock just, just tanked. But a young Warren Buffett saw this happening and was like, this seems like an opportunity to me. And he ran out onto the streets of Nebraska and started asking people, you know, what do you know about this Amex scandal? And they didn't know anything. And so he thought that was a bullish sign. So he bought up a ton of Amex stock and, and made a killing. And that pretty much means that anything, any investment fund Warren Buffett is running is probably a very strong store of value. Of course, there's also my bad kid, which I expect to be a great store of value as well. But none of these things are really money. Right? And neither are your tokens. Now, so one of the things I like about my slides is that it has the title at, at the bottom of every slide. Now, for the last talk I gave, you know, our designer, Joanne, amazing designer, you know, uh, hats off to her, she put the title on the bottom, I deleted it all because it, 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 sort of, it was sort of in the way of the slides. But here it's a nice reminder on every slide that none of your tokens are money and you all have brain damage. Now, the, one of the interesting things about medium of exchange is that actually a lot of things can be a medium of exchange, right? Giving rise to a notion of, of moneyness, right? Money's not just a thing, it's sort of like an adjective. There's moneyness, right? And based on the general willingness of people to accept a thing for settlement. So these are eels. Eels are actually a very common medium of exchange in, in the medieval period. You could settle your rent in eels. These, these things like circulated like, like currency. We would be so lucky for our coins to be as much money as eels. Fucking eels were money, right? The slippery, slippery fucks. Uh, <laughs> there's a wonderful Twitter account called the Eel Historian. I, I can't recommend it, recommend it enough. Of course, there's you know some nice Belgian beer is, is probably better money than, than than our tokens. And barley was you know maybe the original uh, the original money of, of civilized states. Chocolate as well. Cacao was kind of an original money, you know, in the in the South Americas before they were called the Americas. And of course, gold coins. Now, this, this particular gold coin, this is the 1933 Double Eagle. Does anyone in the audience have one of these at home? No? Yeah, you have one? Really? These are extremely illegal, sir. So if you have one, the Secret Service will be knocking at your door because uh, there, are, there are only like 20 known specimens that exist, nine of which were, were destroyed. These things were, were minted in like 1933, and then they, they never put them in circulation. They tried to destroy all of them, and now there's only supposed to be one in, in, in circulation. And the Secret Service, it's like part of their mandate to, to hunt these things down. The Secret Service was actually created in like 1865 after the Civil War with the primary mandate of stopping counterfeit 
money, because there was a lot of counterfeit money in, in the U.S., right? It was only later, after McKinsey's assassination, that, that, that they came to, you know, protect, um, protect presidents. So, you know, states take their money very, very seriously in protection of, of counterfeit goods. So, <clears throat> when crypto people talk about money, for some reason, they only seem to care about the store of value, right? Uh, they invoke, but, but we need to be honest with ourselves, right? These things aren't really money. We're not really talking about money. We're talking about capital. People are invoking discounted cash flow streams, or they invoke, you know, scarcity arguments, preciousness arguments, sometimes both. These things are really like mythologies about the future, right? We're talking about theology. We're talking about some great period in the future where our wildest, you know, our wildest dreams are going to come true, and we're going to realize all the value that we were like discounting in, 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 in the present today. It's important to, to appreciate the sort of religious nature of these kinds of store value and, and capital assets. Okay, so let, let's zoom out for a second and, and, and ask kind of more fundamentally, what is money, right? And I've been trying to answer this question. I've been trying to answer it kind of cleanly, precisely, from studying the history, the institutional structure. The thing I've come to is that money, money is really for payments. It's for denominating and discharging debt. It doesn't mean that all money is debt. A lot of money today happens to be debt. But the institutions of money are really about enabling debts to be created and discharged in a sort of fluid way, right? And that, that's what the history of money is, is all about. And when we think about the functions of money, this is the simplest way I could, I could boil it down. The unit of account is for denominating debts, for creating them. The medium of exchange is for discharging those debts here and now. And the store of value is for discharging those debts elsewhere or later, right? And all of these things are important, and I don't want you to get the impression from me that I don't think the store value function of money is important. It, it is important, but it's not really the thing that, that defines money. But it becomes particularly important when the other functions of money are starting to break down, right? When the unit of account is failing to account properly for things, when the networks of the medium of exchange are, are suffering from crises of illiquidity like they seem to be today. In times like this, it actually matters that we have money that's permissionless, counterparty free, that's a strong store of value, but we can't stop there, right? If, if we stop there, we'll be dwelling in brain damage forever. We, we need to move, move back up to these other functions of money, restore the networks of exchange, restore the ability of the unit of account to actually do meaningful, meaningful accounting. So a unit of account, it's what you denominate your debts in, right? This, this includes what we call prices. The spot market is an illusion. The idea that you can just like swap assets synchronously, that almost never happens. There's always a period of time in which there's a debt, right? I buy, I pick up an asset at a grocery, I pick up a good at a grocery store, it's in my possession, then there's a debt, I owe some money to the, to the cashier, right, to the, to the store. Many business transactions are done uh, on, on credit, right, I ship you some goods, you owe me money in 30 days, we've denominated a debt, it's an invoice, right, this, this is the kind of thing that, that happens all the time. I've been, I've been really trying to investigate the origin of units of account, where did money all start? I, I wrote a, a blog post about this, try, trying to un uncover this, and again, there's sort of deep, interesting, uh, kind of religious history um, about it as well. But one of the things I want to I highlight in, uh, there's another post I wrote about the history of coinage, medieval period. I covered about 1,000 years of history in around 5,000 words. So that's five words per year, which is basically all you need. Um, our story of the pound, shilling, and pence, the libra, soldi, and, and denarii, the story about the separation between the unit of account and, and the medium of exchange, between the names we use to refer to debts and the physical material that we use to actually settle them, right? Now, in today's money, this distinction is it's, it's all but gone, right? Most people associate the dollar, the, the, the dollar of account with the dollar they have in, in their bank account. But this is really a modern invention because for a long time, there was really no coin that was worth a pound. There were only pennies, right? And from time to time, a new coin might be created that was worth a pound, but it was very quickly not worth a pound anymore. These things were always, were always separate, right? And money, money's not a static institution violated only by the actions of greedy kings. It generates its own dynamic instability. Money is, is a very complex institutional, institutional form. You know, the, now let's move on to, to the medium of exchange. I said this is, this is something you use to settle debts when they're due, right? To discharge debts here and now. The ability to settle debts when they're due is often what it means for someone to be liquid, right? You can be insolvent for a very long time, but liquidity kills you quick, right? Uh, I, I, this is a, that's a quote by Perry Merling, who's espoused the money view of economics and, and finance. I strongly, strongly recommend his work on these, um, on these topics. Now, crypto assets are really not either of these. It should be pretty clear to all of you that our crypto assets are hardly at all used as a unit of account or a medium of exchange. But there is one place where they are certainly used and where we could consider them money. 
in, and that's in the context of their own block space, right? The ETH block space seems to be priced and settled, certainly settled in ETH. So ETH is money in the context of the economy centered around its own block space. So, you know, I will, uh, I will throw you a bone here. This is true for every L1. And in this sense, the coins are money, and your brain damage is partially, partially forgivable. You might see I've added a question mark to our little, our little title at, at, at the bottom here. I like to be fair in my critiques, you know, I want, uh, I want to bring you along this journey with me. We're not just all brain damaged forever. There's, there's something we can, we can maybe do about this. There are other, we can think about other monetary circuits. Maybe they're money in more situations, right? Um, ETH, Sol, Atom, they're used in media of exchange. They're used as units of accounts in other crypto-focused circuits. They're base pairs in exchanges. They're used to buy NFTs. They're used for protocol-owned liquidity. Uh, back in 2017, I bet one Atom to Adrian Brink, Brian Crane and Ethan Fry, I don't know if any of them are in, the, are in the room right now, I bet them each one atom that the euro would like fail in five years. I lost that bet. I think I was directionally correct. Uh, the debt is still outstanding. I, uh, Brian reminded me you know, quite uh, graciously yesterday, so I, 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 will, I will pay this debt. But I, I bring it up because I think this was probably the very first time atom was used as a unit of account when we denominated that debt. And that debt was denominated in atom, and atom at the times were worth, I don't know, 10 cents, right? Now they're worth uh, you know, six, $6 or so. So congrats to the three of them on their 60x return. Because we denominated that in, in Adam, you know, they, they have this return in USD, which you know, they will probably have to declare on their, on their tax returns. So it's a significant capital gain, but probably only when I actually, when I actually pay it. Um, so you know, we still have the question mark. Uh, now the question mark is removed, right? Because it doesn't make sense to denominate debts in volatile assets, right? And our assets are, are, are very volatile, and, and that's problematic. People want to be accounting for something, and if the assets are so volatile, then, then you have this question of what are you accounting for, right? Uh, and even the gas prices seem to adjust more to an inherent accounting in US dollars than they do in native tokens. So even the gas prices, even in your own block space, you're not actually denominating you're not using your, your token as, as a unit of account. It's just a medium of exchange. You're denominating in dollars, but you're settling in your, in your token. I think this problem of the unit of account is, is really, you know, what are we accounting for? How do we account for value? What does that mean? This is like the fundamental problem of the 21st century. This is what, it's all, this is what we're all try, trying to figure out. I think you know, there's, there's a lot of stablecoin projects out there, right? Those are media of exchange tokens that are pegged to the US dollar unit of account, typically. But there are some interesting projects trying to, trying to figure out what it means to have a new unit of account, like a Rye, right, from the, the Reflexor Finance guys. This is a, this is a stable coin that's pegged to itself, right? The, the value kind of moves a little bit, but it's not pegged to, to US dollars, it's pegged to itself, so it's still kind of stable, but it's a new kind of unit of account. Now, I don't know if anyone's denominating debts in Rye, but I would be very interested in, you know, maybe I should renew my, uh, my failure of the Euro bet, uh, but do it in Rye this time. Okay, so, so now what? Uh, you know, we all have brain damage, none of the coins are money, what are we going to do about it? Well, this, this brings us back to Cosmos, because the Cosmos philosophy is fundamental of sovereignty, of interoperability. It's fundamentally a monetary philosophy, right? The, so much of the history of sovereignty is dominated by problems of money, problems of liquidity, of legitimacy, of solvency, of both the monetary system and the regime, right? These are, these are highly integrated. It's very difficult to actually decouple monetary history from political history. Some might argue that you know, the, the rise of the you know, philosophical culture in, in ancient Greece was actually a response to the invention of coinage by the Lydians in, in the seventh century, right? The, and the changes in the sort of political dynamics that that, that brought forth, right? And, and with Cosmos, we kind of recognize this very deeply. Monetary sovereignty is sort of part of, our, part of our whole ethos, but it's also a philosophy that recognizes inherently that we don't know know what money is, and it's okay to say that. And, and in the 21st century, where everything is changing, the pol politics are changing, the boundaries are changing, you know, our technology is changing, money means new kinds of things, we're going to need to experiment to figure it out. So what do those experiments look, for, look like? Well, one of them that's, I think, quite interesting is protocol-owned liquidity, right? And, and, and protocol-owned liquidity really is denominated in the native token. When, when the hub lends Atom to, you know, osmosis and neutron and so on, that's debt denominated in Atom, that's payable in Atom, right? That's using Atom as a unit of account, and, and the more of that happening, the more Atom is a kind of money in a unit of account, right? At least in terms of a unit of account. 
Uh, and, and so, you know, this leads us to something we're building called Hydro, which is a decentralized auction platform for protocol-owned liquidity, right? To allow all the capital, and notice I say capital and not money, that's locked up in community pools across the ecosystem to be exported in a frictionless and permissionless way uh, to all the different DeFi protocols, right? For them to bid on it in this decentralized auction platform and to automate this all using the valence protocol from, from the TimeWave team so that we don't just have to rely on, you know, ad hoc esoteric multi-sigs making, um, making governance proposals proposals all the time, right? And we can, we can bring the power of, of these community pools and, and, their, you know, and the atom holder's ability to, to do governance to deploy this capital into the wider ecosystem, right? So Hydro, very exciting project, part of the mission of the hub to make the hub the best place to launch a chain. Um, you know, we need, uh, we need help deploying this and, and, uh, and spreading the word about this. So if you know any good you know, business development people, please, um, or if you're one yourself, uh, please send them, send them our way, even if they have some of this brain damage. That's, that's okay, that's acceptable. Um, Liquid staking is another kind of interesting experiment. It's one that recognizes that the native tokens are store of value capital assets that, that want to remain staked, right? That don't want to be used directly as, as a means of exchange. They want to be stored as, a, as, as, you know, stuck as a store of value. And so we issue this derivative that is liquid that can then be used as a medium of exchange, right? And, and, and so to the extent people want to actually settle their debts, in these liquid staked assets, then they might be able to play more of a role a as an MOE. And we're obviously we're seeing a ton of you know, innovation and, and, and development around, around liquid staking assets. Now, so what does that mean for Atom? Well, I, I do like to say that Atom is, is not money, just like all the other tokens are not money. Of course, it's money in certain limited senses. And you know, it's a unit of account to the extent we're denominating debts in, in, in Atom. And it's a medium of exchange to the extent people are using it to settle things. And I think it would be great to see more, more chains actually you know, allowing Atom for, for gas fees and, and enabling that. And that you know, could help uh, you know, unite the ecosystem and, and, and improve UX and so on. But of all the tokens in the crypto space, Atom is the one with the, with the most decentralized governance over really what it means, over this, the problems of you know, monetary sovereignty, right? ETH fixates on, on deflation, on sound money, right? So on cheap global compute, and Adam fixates on, on the political problems at the heart of money itself, right? Which leads us to the Cosmos Hub, right? The Cosmos Hub is the best place to launch a chain, but it's also the best place to experiment with the meaning of money, right? It's, it's a home to the problem of sovereignty. Sovereignty is a problem. It's not something we can solve. It's not a thing, right? It's a, it's a recurrent problem in the, in the lives of, you know, organized groups of, of human beings, of how they balance the, you know, the tension in between the ruler and the rule, between the rule and the ruler and the law, right? Between the, the constraints that are imposed on the system and the need to be able to exercise judgment in case of, of emergency, right? And, and the hub and its governance is really all about exploring that, experimenting with that, enabling these new kinds of, of innovations to really understand what money is all about, right? And this is, this is the place where, where we're figuring it out. One of the things that we're looking forward to launching using the Cosmos Hub, which is the best place to launch a chain, is a project called Cycles, right? Cycles is, is the culmination of, of our work on you know, monetary history and, and theory and trying to understand where, where money needs to go, what it means to actually build meaningful monetary systems for, for people today that hopefully you know, don't suffer from this, this kind of brain damage. Cycles is an open clearing protocol. It's designed to clear the most debt for the most people with the least amount of money. It's premised on, on this notion that we're kind of wrong about what's important in the financial system. A lot of people in crypto think that you know, assets are the most important power in banking, and if only we had counterparty-free, permissionless assets, then we could seize the power from, from the banks, right? But, but the banks know that this isn't true. The banks source much of their power from the liability side of the balance sheet. We're all kind of afraid to engage with, with liabilities, debts, of his debt, as if debts are bad. I mean, debts are an everyday part of life. You cannot do business. You cannot operate in the free market without debts. And we need, to, we need to be honest about that, take that on board. The power of banking comes from the liability side. They gather in clearinghouses on a daily basis. For hundreds of years they've been doing this. And they clear massive amounts of debts without any money at all. Right? And the rest of us are completely excluded from this. You have no access to clearing, whether you, whether you like it or not. You, you, you cannot participate in these closed clearing clubs. The only experience you might have with clearing is using Splitwise. You know, have any of you used you Splitwise to pay for a bill? Right? You, you, it's with, you know, with some trusted friends. It, it works in small groups, trusted environments. Everyone knows each other, right? But we want to build something that works in general for arbitrary strangers that don't know each other and don't have to anywhere in the world for any kind of debt in a privacy-preserving way. That's what Cycles is about, an open clearing protocol to clear the most debt for the most people with the least amount of money, right? And, and, and this is a very difficult problem to solve, right? Uh, I mean, we're building the technology for it. We also need to bring this to market. We need, you know, good, smart, passionate people that can help us, 
that help us do this, especially you know, business development people, marketing people, business people that, that can really take this to market, think about ways uh, you know, to help actually transform the financial system. So with that, we're hiring. Uh, I'm Ethan. You can check us out on, uh, on Twitter, online. Thank you so much. Hope you, uh, hope you learned something. And uh, that's it for me this week.